there's also a sense that people, while evidence and truth and scientific fact is very important, people want to leave some sort of segment of life to, to mystery and, and to and to the unknown. I mean, you you once were a believer. Was it? And now you were obviously a true follower of, of Darwin, and you've talked about Darwinism. But was that your light bulb moment where you where you changed your mind? Yes, it was. But I, what was? It, how do you preamble that? Do you? Before you ask me that question, because I mean, I was interested in that. I, well, I was going to move on to the mystery. I was saying people need oh, yes, mystery. People yes, need an element of of mystery and. Um, I mean, I was going to I was going to ask you about to talk about Darwinian theory in the sense. Look, okay, that... mystery is great, but mi mystery is to be solved. I mean, that's what science is about: is solving mysteries. I mean, we don't we don't like mystery for its own sake. Well, maybe the people you're talking about do. In which case, I've got no time for that. Um, I think mysteries are a challenge to be solved, to be answered. That's what science is about. We love mystery. But we, but we love it because we're going to solve it. But we haven't. But so the point, as the point I was going to come to, is that we haven't, we haven't solved it all. So I mean, Darwin came along with his theory of, of natural selection, but but we still haven't solved the creation of the universe. So why do you take to people filling that unsolved unknown with a with a god? Fill it with a resolution to answer the question. As you say, Darwin solved the problem of life, but we're still left with the problem of the origin of the universe. That means it's the next problem to go on to. We want to solve the problem of the origin of the universe. Don't just lie down and say, oh, well, we don't know how it began, therefore God done it. I mean, that would be a pathetic, the inadequate way to respond to a mystery. But that's calling a lot of great, great minds pathetically inadequate, isn't it? Because so many people have believed that that, that space, you know, that there is a, a God in that space. I mean, I, I know that um, Einstein has, you know, almost bends to, to whatever you want him to. So you would say he, he was an atheist, but, but he uh, attributed the word God to the kind of randomness and chaos of the unknown. Well, he did. I mean, Einstein liked to use the word God, but for him, God was just a, a euphemism of that which we don't understand. It didn't mean he, went, he was a theist. He most certainly wasn't. He was very vociferous on, the, on that point. Um, and uh, as you say, lots of very, very bright people, including Newton and, and various other people, um, Faraday, have, have believed in God. Um, but that's really not really relevant, especially when I mean, Newton lived 200 years before Darwin. And, and so, I mean, we're very, it would be very hard to be a convinced atheist before Darwin came along. But, but, and even, I mean, so you, even since Darwin came along, there have been many, many people who still feel that that unknown creation can, can, be, can be filled with, with, an, with, a, with a god. Well, <clears throat> uh, if you actually ask them what they believe, um, you, they will say something like, um, well, there's plenty that we don't understand and uh, that there is great mystery. And um, it, like Einstein would say, well, well um, I, I, I'm, Einstein said, I'm a deeply religious man, meaning that he didn't, he, he was religious in the sense that he didn't know, know the answer to things, but he didn't believe in a conscious creator. And if you actually ask those scientists who claim to be religious, um, about 10% will actually genuinely believe in Jesus or um, God, Allah, or, Jehovah. But the great majority of them believe only in the same way as Einstein. They are, they are moved by the mystery of existence, by the mystery of the origin of the universe and so on. Um, but it doesn't mean that they think it was done by a conscious creator. Quite the contrary. You, you say yourself, strictly speaking, it is impossible to prove something does not exist. So you have to entertain or, or do you not, the, the possibility that, that, that it is a possibility? Well, you can't disprove the tooth fairy and mother goose and, and, and fairies and wizards and witches and th things like that. I mean, there's an infinite number of things you can't disprove, but that is very different from saying that, that you have to take them seriously. It's, it's one thing to say I'm agnostic about God and fairies, the tooth fairy uh, and, and, and magic spells and things. But it's another thing to say that it's at all likely. Um, it is, uh, you're still entitled to say that on the balance of probability, um, I don't think the tooth fairy exists and I don't think God exists.
It's interesting. I think that there's a lot has come out um, of this year when you're looking at science uh, and, and science is truth because people look around now at scientists and endlessly, you know, disputes between science. I'm talking about the pandemic. Science is as open to interpretation as almost anything else it feels right now. It is, of course, that's right. And, and it's, it, it's very important to understand that, that, that scientists can disagree about things because the evidence is not all in, the evidence is not, is not totally there. Um, and uh, even interpretation of evidence can, can, can vary. But don't let's get uh, negative about science. Science is our only hope for um, solving things like, we, like the pandemic. We need, a, we need vaccines and it's, science is going to, going to provide them, nothing else will. Just before, um, there's so, so many areas and so many things we, we could go on to, but ju just before I um, invite, and I, I, I can see that the audience haven't taken my advice to wait, there's questions have been piling in, but um, what do you believe then, do, you know, right outgrowing God, do you, do you strive or, or hope to see a society that has entirely outgrown God collectively? Is that what you want to see? Yes, definitely, most definitely, I do. You believe that that I mean, you believe that that is a is a possibility. Oh, that's another matter. Uh, um, I yes, I do. Um, but but um, you, but I certainly hope it is. And you know, if you were, were we can talk about this at a how to academy a how to academy event. You can talk about it. You can debate it um, as as an intellectual. But if you were given, you know, suddenly tomorrow someone came knocking on your door and and, and gave you a position of authority, what would, would be the actual changes then you would make in society? I mean, would they immediately be to education? And where, where would you start with that? Yes, I would. I think. I mean, I think. I think. Um, uh, free open education without um, indoctrination. I think that, with, that when, if children have been seized at a young age and have been told as a, as a matter of, of uh, undeniable fact that God exists and, and that all sorts of much more detailed things than that. I mean, if they're, if they're of Islamic parents have been sent to a madrasa and they've been told that every word of the Quran is literally true, um, Christian parents on the whole don't indoctrinate to quite that extent, but it's still to a, a, to a, to a lesser extent. If children have been got that young, then it's very hard to, to change their minds. I would, I would certainly wish, if I had power, to stop childhood indoctrination. And then I would wish that children should be taught to think, taught to think for themselves, taught to evaluate evidence, taught whenever anybody tells you anything, as a matter of fact, to ask them what the evidence is. Is there evidence for it? If they're very young, of course, it's hard to explain the evidence sometimes, but it should always be the first question, what's the evidence for that? The, the, the right answer to the question is not, well, our people have always believed that, or our holy book says that. The right answer is, there's evidence for it. And here is the evidence. It's interesting, going back to what you were talking about, the tooth fairy, and I've heard you talk about pink unicorns, and when you speak like that, is there no room for, for childhood sort of imagination and, and dreaming and, and thinking of things that aren't, you know, living in worlds that aren't true? Yes, I think it is important, to, and, and I think that um, fairy stories are valuable. I, th I think that letting the child's imagination soar uh, th through, through stories is, is important. I'm, I'm, I'm not against that. But I, I want, want to stress that we've been talking about religion a lot, but the, the, second, the whole of the second half about growing God is about evolution, not about religion at all. It's, it's, it's about science. So I wouldn't want, want to give the impression that this is an atheist tract. It's in fact at least 50% uh, is, is, is a science book. Well, I mean, I was, before we got to mystery, that's where I was essentially going, talking about, obviously, you, 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 your main reason for, for writing the book or for talking about that is to do with Darwinian theory. And so I was you know, thinking that's how you explain the great mysteries to some people of, of the beauty of nature. And you, you have pictures in the book of termite castles and, and you know, starlings in the sky. And all of that can be explained. Yes, it can. Um, I mean, may, maybe not in every detail yet, but Darwin has provided us with the tools we need to explain everything about life. And all that remains now is to, is to flesh out the details.
Can, can I move? Can I move to some of there's a there's a great number of um of of questions. Yes, of course. Somebody says, how close do you think we are to determining? And we've touched this that the chemical or origin of life. Well, that's a very difficult and interesting question. Um, there are various theories of it. No, no theory is um, predominant at the moment. Um, one of the more fashionable ones is the RNA world theory, which is the idea that the first genetic molecule, the, pro the problem is how did the first genetic molecule ar arise? It probably wasn't DNA. DNA is the one that pervades life at the moment, but it probably wasn't DNA because DNA is too, too much of a, what's been called a high tech replicator. Um, the RNA world theory suggests that RNA uh, was the forerunner. It's still very important, but, but not as a genetic molecule. So no, the, the problem of the origin of life is not solved. Um, it can never probably be solved directly because it happened a long time ago uh, and we can't probably recreate the conditions under which it happened. What we, the most we can probably hope for is that somebody comes up with a model which is so persuasive that we say, oh, of course, it's got to be that. That is so obviously the, um, an elegant theory that it almost certainly has to, be, has to be right. That's probably the most we can hope for. Somebody asks, are you a materialist? What science in the 20th and 21st century has been discovered to suggest this? Are your views at odds with the pioneers of quantum mechanics? No, I mean, qu quantum mechanics is not an immaterial theory. Um, it's, a, it, it's very sophisticated, very difficult for non-physicists to understand. Actually, it's pretty difficult for physicists to understand, but it would be wrong to say that it, that it, was, it was not materialist. It, it is materialist. Um, there's obviously, because we've touched on two, two separate areas, the questions are, are, are sort of obviously between, between, yeah, fixed in between, but um, why do humans have, let's go back to these um, subversive sub-goals. Why do humans have those? Well, um, it's an interesting question. I think it's probably that our brains got so big that it, the possibility of subversion um, be, became a real one. I mean, any animal could subvert in, in the same way. Uh, um, in, any animal where, where hedonistic pleasure um, becomes more important than the main goal of gene survival could be said to be subject to subversion. Um, if say an animal enjoys sex so much that um, it, um, as it were, becomes obsessive about sex and, um, uh, and they don't, don't have access to contraception. So it's not quite the same thing, but um, perhaps if the animal becomes so obsessed with sex that it uh, neglects um, parental care, say, and lets babies, lets children starve um, because of being too, too busy um, having sex. That, that would be a kind of subversion. But with, with humans, our brains have become so big and we have become so dominated by cultural evolution as opposed to genetic evolution. Uh, we have become, we live in a world of books, we live in a world of the internet, we live in a world of films, um, we live in a world where so much of what we see and hear around us is the product of human history, human, human culture. It's really very easy to become obsessed with sub goals which are only very distantly related to the main goal of uh, gene propagation. So I think it's probably because our, our brains became so big. Our brains became big in the service of the genetic survival. That's why they became big, natural selection, for various reasons which are interesting to go into. Natural selection favored big-brained individuals. But then as a byproduct of that, we became capable of doing all sorts of other things which are not directly related to gene survival. They're only indirectly related and which can be regarded as subversive sub goals. So then moving away from, from the sub goals into the sort of idea of if there is any evidence for an existence of, of God, somebody um, asks, do you believe there can ever be any subjective, subjective, subjective evidence for that? What evidence would it take you to acknowledge such, such, such an existence if indeed there was any? Well, subjective evidence is difficult, isn't it? I suppose by subjective evidence, one would mean something like a, a 
an inner conviction of the a feeling that God is actually talking to you. That I think would be very unpersuasive because people have hallucinations all the time and we have, every night we dream um, and dreams are a, a, a good demonstration of the power of the brain to make up stories, make up voices talking in our head and, and so on. So I don't think subjective evidence would ever be, should ever be convincing. Um, Objective evidence might be another matter. I mean, I, I, I've sometimes thought that, that if, if Jesus were to suddenly appear trailing clouds of glory from the clouds, um, that that would be pretty convincing. <laughs> but, um, so maybe that'll happen, but- You've, I, you've I, thought I that. What? You've, you've even, you have thought that. That has popped into your mind. Well, yes. Um, I, I'm not sure how convincing it would really be, but because I, I think, I think again, I think it might be a, might be a hallucination. But um, um, uh, anyway, it, I don't think it's going to happen. So. <laughs> and uh, uh, somebody asks, if the ultimate end goal is gene survival, it's an important point. How does one justify continuing one's life once your offspring has survived infancy and is no longer dependent on you as a parent, um, especially in light of potential overpopulation? problems. P.S. I'm a school teacher watching with students and that question came from Tom. Th thank you Tom. Okay hello Tom. Um, well it, really the, the answer I want to give is, this, is the one I've given several times that, that, that we as humans do, are not, don't have to be slaves to our selfish genes. I mean I've, the, the, um, the, the last words of my first book The Selfish Gene are we, we have the power to rebel against the tyranny of the selfish genes. So um, if you either finish your reproduction or if you don't intend to reproduce and never have intended to reproduce, that doesn't matter because you can, you've got these perfectly laudable, praiseworthy, wonderful sub-goals which can go on until you drop. Uh, so that, that would be my, my personal answer. If you want a, a, a Darwinian answer, um, there's plenty of good reasons for Darwinians to go on um, surviving after they've reproduced because you can care for your grandchildren great-grandchildren. Uh, Jonathan asks, 200 years ago, science told us that Newtonian physics were correct. Science has since revised its views, so similar to what we were discussing, due to relativity and quantum mechanics. How do we know that God or some notion of a role of a godlike figure won't be proven to exist in 100 years in a way we cannot envisage now? It would not totally surprise me if uh, we discovered that um, uh, there was some superior intelligence in the universe uh, that somewhere, maybe some, some alien life form on another planet somewhere is so far advanced over us that if we ever met it, we would feel like dropping to our knees and worshiping it because it'd be so much more advanced than, than us. If they ever got here, we probably would do that anyway because they'd have to be very much superior to us in order to get here. Um, that doesn't mean that they're gods, that would mean that they're like gods, but they would have to have come about by the same kind of incremental evolutionary process as we came about. What is an enormous difference between a creature which is godlike, in the sense of being very advanced, intelligent, complicated and so on, and a real god in the sense it was there right from the start of the universe without having to, have, having to evolve. Um, so yes, I mean, I, th I think that, that there could be a scientific evidence one day for something, something godlike, but I don't think an actual God in the sense of a creator 